Welcome to Fading Memories, a podcast with advice, wisdom, and hope from caregivers who have lived the experience and survived to tell the tale. Think of us as your caregiver best friend. Hey, welcome back, everybody. It's Jennifer here. Just want to always tell you how much I appreciate some of your time. I think you're going to super enjoy today's uh, topic and guest. With me is Leanne McKinley. And as you know, I've talked to some lawyers about how to prevent financial abuse and, and all that stuff with our loved ones, estates and money. Well, Leanne has lived the experience and she is taking an international stance to change the laws on elder abuse, financial elder abuse, due to the situation that she experienced. So thanks for joining me, Leanne. Thank you for having me. Excited. Awesome. Thank you so much. So why don't you got you you've been a caregiver, you were a caregiver coach in the past. So why don't you kind of give everybody your history and then you can then you could tell us your your nightmarish tale. <laughs> <laughs> so I was, yeah, I've been a coach for a long time and a real estate and business coaching and I have my holistic health degree. And uh, really, after being thrown unexpectedly into the situation with my dad, uh, I actually wrote a book proposal uh, to Hay House that I wasn't picked just to help inspire, as this, as my background says, inspire caregivers. Because, you know, until you're thrust into it, you don't realize how incredibly challenging it is. And we're not, you know, paid. Um, <laughs> my oldest daughter is a nurse. God bless her. She's an ER nurse. She runs the Children's Hospital of Eastern Ontario here in Ottawa, Canada. And she gets burnt out. And she always says, you know, even in the, the medical industry, it's a, it's a hard job. And yet we get cast into it without training. We're not paid. And it's lonely. And so mm -hmm. I'm on this mission to help change the way we care give and how the elders receive care. And uh, even, you know, more, I wouldn't say closer to my heart, even more imminent, because I don't think anybody's really doing anything about it, is changing the laws after what I lived through. For sure. Yeah, it's and you know, as I tell people all the time, my paternal grandmother lived to 103. So people got to put up with me for another 46 and a half <laughs> years, because that's my goal. <laughs> yes, exactly. That's my goal too. <laughs> now, gonna... I don't have a lot of relationship with family, so there's not a lot of options for somebody to, to like rip me off, but that doesn't mean I'm immune to this problem. And unfortunately, it's it's a bigger problem than I think most people realize. Absolutely. You know, it's, it's easy to pick up a prescription and then just add a few things to your cart, you know just because you need them and you're there. I mean, it's not, it doesn't necessarily have to be nefarious or, you know, mm -hmm. you're not trying, trying to be a bad person, but it's, it's not easy. And as you said, you know, you get thrust into this. I had a past guest that referred to it as that Tuesday afternoon phone call that changes your life. Yep. And, you know, we can't all be, you know, medical professionals, financial professionals, legal professionals, <laughs> advocates. I mean, the yeah. skill set it takes to be a decent caregiver is huge. Absolutely. So yeah. I'm I'm big yeah. on trying to educate people because even if you think, oh, you know, I don't my parents are gone, I didn't have to deal with this, at some point you are likely going to be touched with somebody living with some form of dementia because it's just a growing problem. Uh, mm -hmm. my husband goes and has lunch regularly at our sports lounge, which is at the end of the golf course. And there's a gentleman that's lived in this community for years and years. Um, his Alzheimer's is progressing and he's becoming a problem. So I have volunteered um, just, we've just had this conversation. So it's, it's fresh to help educate people in the community that have had to deal with him and the staff at the sports lounge that have had to deal with him because there was, I guess, a ladies golf tournament. And when it was over, the, volume of ladies at the sports lounge was off the chart. And he, you probably know people with Alzheimer's can't tune out a lot of that noise. And it was, yeah. it was like a 15 on, on a scale of one to 10. It was just atrocious. And he finally, he had his hands over his ears and he finally yelled at them to shut the, shut the F up. Only he used the whole word. So, you know, that's not appropriate. The volume at the ladies was not appropriate. Fortunately, my husband was there to prevent any, right. you know, you know well, it's only, any it's only outrage. Gonna, 
and it's only getting worse. We're an aging demographic. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and you talk about, you know, um, I forget the exact term you use, just tolerating it. You know, my mission is uh, to have more empathy for it. You know, in, in the struggle with my dad, one thing happened, we, he was working in the U S and Florida, he was a land developer and a municipal lawyer. And I had actually been estranged to my whole family. So we talk about family, you know, dysfunctional family. I'd actually lost contact um, with him and I had heard all kinds of crazy stories from my mother, the one that stole all his money. And um, it just indirectly. And um, the, I forget what I was going to say. You were talking about the tolerance. Yeah. So while I was there, he, I can get into the story a little bit more because it's a pretty wild one. Um, I had to go back to the United States on a court order in the middle of COVID to sell his Florida homes, which was illegally done, signed. They cashed his life insurance out illegally. And so he's in the hospital. This is when he just finally got the official diagnosis. And uh, we had to fly him from Ottawa to Canada. So we had our doctor's note with eight pages of explaining his dementia and the border security for the United Airlines didn't like his answers to the questions. So they detained him and he missed his oh. flight. Oh, no. So now. Oh, yeah. Oh, no. So now um, we're up scrambling. Actually, I said United. I apologize. It was actually Air Canada. We're up scrambling all night, worried because the other airlines don't have assisted help for anything like that. And so. Just go back to, you know, people being annoyed by it. I mean, like you said, everyone's going to be touched by it. We're all aging and we need to understand it and have compassion for it. Because that just floored me that they had the, they had the diagnosis. They had an eight-page eight medical doctor's report and they forced him to answer questions and he didn't answer them to his satisfaction. So they didn't let him get on board. And I mean, it's just wild how much growth we need to, to make in this direction, you know? Yeah grow a lot and very rapidly. Yes. That just blows that just blows me away. And all they did was make everybody's situation in that moment difficult. You know, the, the oh, yeah. people who were questioning him, the people who had to deal with him. I mean, just a little yeah. bit of understanding of the disease and a little bit of training, everybody <laughs> would have been a whole lot better off. I mean, it's Not as it's the same thing when I reported what was going on to the police in Florida. They said, well, he was too trusting. Do you, like, is that really your answer? Are you kidding me? So somebody you know? robbed me, but I'm just this sweet, nice gal. So it's my yeah. fault that you broke the law? Hmm. Yeah. yeah, we need to recognize that the elders, even without dementia, you know, our brain diminishes and, and uh, our capacity diminishes and we're more vulnerable. And then you compound it with dementia, any form. My dad has two types of dementia. He was an alcoholic. So he has alcohol induced dementia. And then he also has the frontal lobe, frontal lobe. So, you know, we, anyways, I just really want to educate the world and to, uh, to notice the signs, you know, because my life changed on my birthday. <laughs> Happy birthday. Yeah. Yeah. You. Know? you. Yeah. So why you, don't you... I was... Oh, go ahead. Well, why was I say, why don't you tell the story? Cause we've, We've teased it. Now people are hopefully sitting on the edge of their seats with their hands on their AirPods going, okay, we want to hear the story. <laughs> I'll just preface it that my attorney who helped me voluntarily because I didn't have the cash because this is how bad it was. Um, a police investigation of 700 emails. I'll just preface that I, it's, uh, I'm writing a, a book um, in a fictional way, not necessarily all about this, about the family trauma and the healing and everything that I got from it. Um, as a holistic spiritual coach, I'm in writing it from that perspective. However, I have to tell you that I've heard from more than one attorney who said this should be a, a movie because it's really that crazy and it's wild. So I had already uh, be coming out of, out of a dysfunctional family. I have been told by therapists, you know, I was the scapegoat of the family to, to leave the family unit. So I'd already had no contact. So it starts, uh, I get a Father's Day text from my dad knowing that and I was told by the therapist when I left the family, everybody would fall apart. So my sister, my mother, and my aunt, who were all, believe me, gaslit me, gaslit me, all lost their marriages, all had failed marriages, like within a couple of years after I walked out of the family unit. Because I was the person they were like throwing their dysfunction at, right? I was the blamed person. So I heard through the rumor reveal that my mom left my dad. 
it turns out I found out that she found out he had dementia and she hadn't worked in 40 years. So, you know, and he was a lawyer and a land developer. So worth millions. So he's in Florida on this work visa, Canadian, and the parents have been going to Vero Beach, Florida for 15, 20 years. He's got a rental property down there. He's on a work visa to do land development subdivision. And I get this text on Father's Day of 2018. Happy Father's Day, Leanne. So I'm wondering, do I answer this? Do I answer this? You know, so finally I called him after he called me back, like in a couple months later that day and we chatted. And then a couple months later in August, on the long weekend of the civic holiday, he called me and said, I need to go to the ER, like come and get me now. And he was in Ottawa defending himself against divorces with my mom because I didn't know at the time he had no money to do his lawyer couldn't afford to pay him anymore my mom stole a bunch of money out of his account so I he doesn't do doctors so I get him to the ER and the doctor says to me he has an emergency hearing the next day because what happened was it's a little convoluted he was on a work visa in the U.S. to do a land development and he was going to be a business partner in that development and so she stole 150 to U.S. thousand out of his business account and his investment check bounced. And this is when he was high functioning in 2017. And we really, you know, didn't know. And uh, his check bounced. So his business partners canceled his work visa. So now he had no income. So he says to them in court on the Friday back to August 2018, uh, you're not getting what you want because I don't have income anymore. So the original offer on the table is not, you're not getting those things. You've got as much as you're going to get from me. So well, she didn't like that. So the lawyer wanted to hold an emergency hearing. So back in the hospital and the doctor says, I've been doing this a long time. And this is the worst case of alcohol withdrawal I've ever seen in my life. We have to do brain scans. He cannot attend court. He's not fit to make decisions. We don't know if he suffered brain damage. So I email the lawyers on power of attorney. I'm going to show up to court the next day. Medical letter saying not fit to make decisions. I show up to court on the Tuesday. They don't show I show up to court the next day. They don't show. I show up the next day. They don't show. Four days in a row. I finally emailed the clerk at the uh, courthouse here in Ottawa, Ontario, Canada. And uh, like what the, what the TF is going on. Well, little did I know they had him somehow got a hold of him and had him sign everything. Life insurance policies. They put liens on his houses in Florida. So the police have an email from the lawyer who was working for him. They were drugging him in his opinion. The cleaning lady who my mom's cleaning lady of 10 years was his friend, quote unquote, uh, coming in, not cleaning and drinking and getting drunk when I would be there visiting. Um, so then I have little contact. I visited him a couple of times, 2018. And then on my birthday, 2019, December 8, just, you know, in the midst of the very beginning of the pandemic, I get a call from the cleaning lady. It's urgent. Your dad's in the hospital. He's almost died. He has no money for prescriptions. Can you send money? So. I called him the next, I, you know, said, it's my birthday. I'll deal with this in the morning. I called him the next morning and said, what is going on? I will be down there. I'm not just sending money to this lady. Well, on the drive, yeah, on the drive down, the hospital calls me, the social worker. She had asked for permission to remove his bank cards from the hospital. So they reported her to elder abuse. So I get down there. There's mail stacked like this. In the U.S., you can get your bank pay your bills paid by ripping off your bank account. We don't do that in Canada. So mail opened with all the bank car account numbers ripped off the top of the statements. I had to break into the house because she had removed the key from the lockbox. The Lanai screens were taken off. They were going to remove the furniture. I had to get restraining orders because she was 300, three, is, you know, was at the time 300, about 300 pounds, like built like a sumo wrestler and threatening me, you know, I'll come when I F and want to the door. So I get there and uh, he's in foreclosure notice with no money for prescriptions, medicine. He almost died. They read him his last rights in the hospital um, and two illegal liens on his property in favor of my mother. I didn't know that at the time, but I had to come up with 12,000 U.S. dollars, um, you know, pay his bills, my bills and try to get him home. So uh, a few months later, COVID hits. My daughter being a nurse says, you know, come here because you don't have insurance. I had a thirty five thousand dollar bill even with his ARP insurance to pay for the hospital stay, he was the short one he was at and not enough money to pay it. And, you know, here's, I'm trying to figure out where the money's gone. She stole his laptop when she was there in the middle of the divorce. He trusted her enough to give her access to the house for six weeks, all his bank statements, everything gone. I had no evidence. Of course, he had no recollection of anything, you know, any, any clear recollection. So I'm like, you know, Indiana Jones meets the desperate housewives trying to figure out 
where the hang the money's gone. And at first I thought it was the cleaning lady. So I'm at the bank where he banks and I'm like, could you tell me if like, would it show, can you look up if there he's paying anything, you know, mortgage payments for this cleaning lady. So I do a title search and they, they, this is like two months there. I'm like, this is February. Now I drove down just before Christmas. I had to wheel him, you know, he was in a wheelchair to walk him back, you know, into health and get him to AA. And I'm like, it was a full-time job and I'm working and coaching. And um, they find these illegal liens on the property. And they said, like, how did they do this? So she, he had fired these lawyers for his first subdivision development down there. My mom manages to hire the same law firm. And the judge is from the firm. It's, yeah. Yeah. It's not legal in Florida if you have two homes in California and one in New York and you're getting a divorce, there is no legal precedent to put a lien on the property for your equity or your share on your home. It's not allowed. Yet they had him sign it and submitted it to the court in Ottawa. And then these lawyers took it from my mother and got the judge to put the liens on the property. So now I'm stuck there. And my attorney says, I mean, I had to make some mortgage payment to to, to give retain him. He took just a thousand dollars into the situation. He said, you got to go to court and prove that this happened. And she's likely going to say, we don't even have the legal recourse to do this here, even though it was allowed. You're going to have to go back to Canada and have it removed. I've got no money. So anyways, we come back from March from COVID because at this point with the bills, you know, we're, we're crazy. We didn't know what we were dealing with the pandemic. They were telling about, like, all the Canadians to get home. So I get him to a resort. My the nurse, the daughter of mine, the nurse pays for us for a few months, and then because we brought him back to Ottawa, the doctor here wanted him to detox a lot faster. So she puts him on a get off the booze instead of what I was doing in Florida, which is slowly because he was drinking sixty ounces of vodka a day on ice. Oh, that's well, a lot. you don't even well, especially when you don't remember how much you're drinking. Yeah. So, <laughs> so I. Uh, I uh, he goes on this full detox and he starts to react to the drugs. He gets aggressive. I have to call the police. And he ends up in the hospital. And that's when he got his formal diagnosis. So now it's June 2020. And he's finally in the hospital getting his diagnosis. And I am in Ottawa and I get this. You've got 10 days to meet the court order to sell his properties. <laughs> I am a licensed real estate agent who has won international sales awards. And we had about 20 offers go through. I was, I could have fought her, my mom, but at this point I'm like, let her, like, I got to go back to Ottawa. I don't have the money. I called all kinds of lawyers. There's no legal aid for anything like this because mentor patients don't get legal aid. And mm. neither does uh, in Canada, neither does a divorce family law situation. So couldn't get legal aid. So I finally said, well, we'll give her the money. She put two liens on one saying if she didn't get the enough money, she'd get the second lien. She reneged on the last day and didn't renew the second lien either. So she got all the money. And uh, now the IRS has just reported her because she tried to cash out his crypto return. So it's still going on. Oh, and Lord. Um, it took a while. It was their year because all the buyers with all these this these illegal liens were scared. They didn't know and no lawyer could properly advise them what that meant at the time at the closing table because it's just not done in the U.S. So. The, the police called me and said, oh, we see what she's done. Well, yeah, I gave you 700 emails of evidence. And it gets worse than that. Like the lawyer that helped her was supposed to be sending him money uh, for he had part of what he had to sell was a commercial building that my ex-brother-in-law owned a Milano pizza in. And he, my the ex-brother-in-law owed my dad money. And he was sending him $2,500 a month. And that lawyer changed that agreement. I was part of that agreement. I actually signed the agreement, changed it and stopped sending him the money. So we would go into receivership. And then he, the, the wings would be in favor of my mother. She could take all of the house, houses. So it was, it's pretty dirty and involved a lawyer. I had six lawyers locally look at it and say he should be criminally charged and disbarred. But we don't go after our own. And the police called me and said, oh, we know what he's done. But if you had assigned your POA at a courthouse and not had an emergency on a holiday, you'd have a better chance of getting it fought in court, which I think is baloney because... We can't control emergencies and yeah, it doesn't no wash with me. Um, so that's hence why I want to change the law, you know? Well, when we were chatting, I forgot if it was, I think it was via email. I can't remember. It's, yeah. Been, yeah. it's been crazy times. So we have a family friend whose 
sister-in-law has early onset Alzheimer's and the mother-in-law is advanced years and her mental capacity is, it's, it's less than normal, but she doesn't necessarily have dementia, but she has other needs. So apparently, okay, so I live in California. This gal had, had several homes, a couple of homes in Southern California and her siblings um, took out home equity lo loans. They took all the equity out of the houses and then basically stole it all from her. And now she's living with our friend and his wife. So it's mm -hmm. his sister-in-law is living with them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, the mother-in-law is living with them. <laughs> his wife, yep. who still works, is losing her mind. And he's just, you know, I, I advised him, you know, nine months prior that he needed to call adult protective services. He needed to call finance. You know, it's like, and, yep. and it was like, but it's family. We, him and yeah. it was like this that wasn't him it was the wife you know i'm like of course you don't want to go after your family because that's yeah. freaking ugly yeah. so it's must be kind of calm i wonder you it's know very my husband common. yeah my husband's also a real estate agent is there do you think real estate is there's no, i mean god knows i don't know about in canada but california man, <laughs> we have to cut down a whole tree just for the contract to buy and sell a home <laughs> it's ridiculous yeah. um do you think the laws surrounding like these real estate type transactions is that where we need to strengthen things or which direction are you fo focusing on it sounds I, like a, well it sounds like a mess <laughs> it was a mess and i mean don't and, and not only that my sister was pleading to send money i think i think it needs to start with the, the power of attorney laws and and about re early detection because uh, people had told me before I knew what was going on that he was not acting, he was acting a little radical. And I think, um, but first of all, that lawyer acted in multiple capacities. It represented my mom, my dad, and my ex-brother. That needs to be <laughs> legal. Um, they're protecting their own, I'm sorry, um, that boys, old boys club that happens here in Ottawa, Canada, about we don't go after other lawyers, that needs to stop. And the other thing that happened, I did find one lawyer that said he would help me, but the law society through his error and emissions insurance would pay for his defense. And so I would need a hundred thousand dollars to defend, to go after him. So the law, the, we need a tiered system. And then when I got to Florida, the bank said, well, I kept seeing him emailing all these money transfers of large, like $20,000. And, and so I think it needs to happen at a lot of levels, which is why it's a complex problem. I think we need uh, more awareness because if you, it, I think caregivers need to know the police have told me both in Canada and the United States, the Alzheimer's Society, the Dementia Society, the same in both Canada and the United States. This happens every day. And it's more often than not family members. And so yep. if you're the caregiver, you need to understand that uh, the conversations need to be had earlier on. I'm 54 and I need to, my daughters and I, because we've been cast into this, you know, have the conversations early on, get the power of attorneys early on, be checking bank statements early on. And have the, those things safeguarded early. And banks need to, I mean, the banks really pushed back. Uh, he was going to go to jail on top of that because of money missing from my late grandmother's bank account. And the, the bank here did another bank, did not want to prove, give me bank statements. And it turns out after two years with my attorney, it was my mother that stole money out of my late grandmother's bank account. And my dad's brother was trying to sue him because they didn't know. And it's a criminal act here. So it needs to happen on all levels. The banks need to, you know, they need to be getting at a certain age. I hate to say it. And I know people are going to be really angry with me when I say this because we, we know it's happening earlier on. I just think at certain ages we need to, you know, the banks need to have a power of attorney on file because it is a growing problem and they need to be able to say, you know, Hey, this is, and what I'm going to be advocating for is a central power of attorney, which probably again, a lot of people aren't going to like, but an agency government re legislated power of attorney so that if I need a power of attorney, I'm only going to get it from to confirm that there's one power of attorney from one central agency that deems that I'm competent to be the power of attorney, that I'm not stealing money, that I'm doing the honorable thing. Because in Canada, I could give you power of attorney. I can give two to my daughter, one each to my daughters, to my grandson. That can't happen. Because what's the point of having it? If it's not going to bear the weight that it's meant to, then we need to change the laws. So I think it's to answer your question. It's not simple. It's a big task, but it starts individually with the caregiver having the conversations and as uncomfortable as it is, 
monitoring and getting permission from your parents early on or your elders or your siblings to check the bank statements to make sure that they're not, you know, money's not disappearing or they're not forgetting to make bill payments because you probably are well aware the first faculty that tends to go is their ability to manage their finances. And um, so that's the first thing to look at and to be aware, to raise awareness um, that if you're a lawyer, you're a doctor, you're a banker, and you start to see some of those symptoms um, or those red flags that you there's a reporting agency that there's somewhere you need to go. And that doesn't exist as far as I know. And correct me if I'm wrong, but it needs to be. It needs to be happening so that the assessments can happen early on because that's the other challenge. Getting the diagnosis happens too late in the process traditionally. And by then, a lot of the damage has been done. One of the first early signs of potential Alzheimer's or other dementia, I learned this from a past guest. Um, She's a financial journalist. She wrote a book called Hey Mom, Dad, We Need to Talk. And um, is the inability to like... They start making financial mistakes and, you know, it's really easy to brush some of those things off. But if you start seeing a pattern, you know, and they may seem fine, you know, that is actually a very big red warning flag. And then to your point about the power of attorneys, when my parents set up their trust, my dad made me made me the exclusive healthcare power of attorney. And God only knows why he did this. My sister, and as kids, we'd get a dollar allowance. She'd spend a dollar ten to a dollar twenty-five, and then come begging me for extra for the extra. Why he made us both the power of attorney for the finances? I well, I do know why. He was trying to force us to to be friends and like each other. Yeah. Well, that was the dumbest. I mean, like, why would that ever work? <laughs> I mean, even if we, you know, eh, that did not work. I know. And I know. um, being the power of attorney is not necessarily. You know, I, with the, with the healthcare power of attorney, when it became obvious my dad needed to go on hospice, that was my decision. But I made sure that I could bring my sister along, that I gave her that little bit of extra time to get on the same page. It was hard. And there was a lot of things about being the POA that I learned way after both my parents died. So thankfully, you know, it did not all go perfectly with my sister and the finances, but, you know... We closed everything out. We went our separate ways. You know, it was all okay. We, you know, there was never an accounting done. I mean, there was like, she didn't account to me for anything she spent. I didn't account to to her for anything I spent for mom. It could have been a giant mess. So yeah, I totally agree with you. Although, you know, being in the United States, like get the government involved. Oh God, no. I know. And listen, I'm not like, we won't get into politics. I'm not a fan of any government right now. I don't care anywhere in the world. Sorry. Um, I, I don't disagree so, with you. So I, I uh, you know, I, I, I hate to say that. I just don't know how else to to do it. That you know, I mean, there needs to be better regulation because again, the police tell me it happens every day, every day. I mean, there's a full time elder abuse sergeant. The one that looked at my file was a full is a sergeant for the auto police. That's all he does oh, all day, geez. every day. Right. Poor guy. So, <laughs> so um, it's, it's, it's really in demand. It needs to happen. And if I can do it on a private level, I would do it. You know, I just, I think people would trust a government more so than a private entity. I just think there needs to be regulation with one power of attorney. I don't think, I don't want to believe in the two um, power of attorneys. Um, because again, somebody could go behind you. Your sister could go to gone behind your back and done something. And that's not the point of the power of attorney. And it is a commitment, man. Mm-hmm. It's a commitment. When I got, so the, the, the way it works with the FERPTA return, when we had to sell the houses, they withhold the 15% on taxes, right? To make sure they doesn't win income taxes. Well, when I got the 10 page report from the IRS just a few months ago, you know, signing, like you didn't cash this, did you? I was like, there's a, there's a level of seriousness that, you know, you know, do I want to report my mom? No, but I'm sure it's not going to take responsibility for it. So yeah. there's, there's, you know, there's an element of, um, you know, you have to be the champion and the advocate in every way of, you know, financial, in my case, it's both financial and health. And you have to really take it seriously and be committed. And that, that goes along with, you know, I started a group, I'm writing the book now, so I stopped posting and it just honoring our elders where I just, 
I want us to get, you know, to a place where we don't see our elders as a burden, even though it is, it, it is in a lot of ways, it's, um, it's, it's converting it into what am I gaining out of this? Cause even as hard as it was, I mean, I healed so much in this journey, uh, with my mom and, um, you know, just really understanding that she really is probably a sociopath. Um, <laughs> and, um, that I wasn't the dysfunction that I was always blamed to be because whoever could do this to an elder, in my opinion, is got to go and get themselves looked at in the mirror really, help, really, help, yeah. really carefully. Um, but I know it, it's, it's, it happens. And so, yeah, not, not necessarily, I know what a lot of people want to hear. I just think that the government needs to take control because they can mandate that the banks have a certain, when you see one or two red flags, there's got to be a reporting. There's got to be earlier diagnosis. There has to be accountability to the POAs um, and, and something registered uh, to help. Because even getting a POA, you probably know, and your guests probably know, your listeners, getting it after the fact can also be extru- extremely hard and difficult. Yeah, we yeah. we did our estate in 2020, so it's all been assigned. You know, my okay. parents did theirs years and years ago, and then it was updated and blah, blah, blah. But even then, after my dad passed away, so the estate essentially said if my father died, this stuff went to my mother. Well, okay, that's fine, except for the fact that she couldn't make a decision on what to wear or what to eat, much less anything, you know, significant, financial, and legal. And then we actually had to go to an elder law attorney who had to read through the um, estate paperwork and mm-hmm. the trust paperwork to find where it said what would what would happen if my mom was incapacitated and you know i mean it was money well spent because our next step would have been having to go to court to have her declared incompetent and right. that's just an ugly scenario and well, you know especially you're trying to mourn your you know your deceased parent yeah thankfully he found it but it's like you know it's just yeah yeah i'm a huge advocate for when somebody gets a when a family gets a diagnosis of alzheimer's or ftd or Parkinson's, um, dementia, whatever. They can't just be, here's a pamphlet, pat them on the shoulder and say, good luck. See you in six months. That to me is almost criminal. There need the, the doctor's offices need a support system that says, okay, your dad's got FTD, Jen, your mom's got Alzheimer's disease. Okay. We need to, you know, connect you to this yes. oh, entity. Yeah and get you educated and up to speed on what's going to, you know, what to expect. Because just the constant unknowns and the, I didn't know I had to take care of that too. Like, I'm just trying to run my life and make sure mom's doing okay. And I'm supposed to be doing what? Okay. I know. Let me figure this out. It's like, now we're going to take a quick break for an ad. These ads help me continue to bring the show to you for free. When I learned that despite eating as healthy as possible, we can still have undernourished brains, I was frustrated. I also live in a farming community, so I'm aware that our food isn't grown as well as we need. Learning about NeuroReserves, Relevate, and how it's formulated to fix this problem convinced me to give them a try. Now I know many of you are skeptical, as was I. However, I know it's working because of one simple change. My sweet tooth is gone. I didn't expect that, and it's not something other users have commented on, but here's some truth. My brain always wanted something sweet. Now, fruit usually did the trick, but not always. One bad night's sleep would fire up my sugar cravings so much they were almost impossible to ignore. You ever have your brain screaming for a donut? Well, for me, those days are gone. It's been about six months since I started taking the supplement, and I have no regrets. I believe in my results so much that I'm passing on my 15% discount to you. Try it for two or three months and see if you have a miraculous sweet tooth cure or maybe just better focus and clarity. It's definitely worth a try. Now back to our conversation. Yeah, just navigating. This is why, you know, I wanted to, um, to really be more coaching. It's just, I lost all my coaching clients trying to care for my dad because he was a flight risk. He'd take off down the road in the middle of my coaching. And people don't like to pay you $250 an hour for that kind of call. <laughs> or he was electrocuting himself with the hairball running under the running water, you know, Ooh. we're ready to. So that those scenarios, but 
navigating the healthcare system is another disaster. It's like a spider web of, you know, if you don't talk to the right people who happen to be in the know, it, it's, it's an, an onerous task. It's daunting. And this is why, you know, it, it needs some serious attention. And I, and um, yeah, I, I applaud you for what you're doing because it really needs some serious organizational attention and the caregivers. I mean, I don't know how many Facebook groups I've been in where the caregivers are down and out and depressed and alone and stressed and overwhelmed and there's not enough hours in the day and there's nobody that gives them that kudo you are doing. I mean, as far as I'm concerned, the unsung heroes of of our day and age, really and truly sacrificing our own lives. I mean, it's um, especially with the more housebound you get. And as yep. you know, there's that, that um, stigma. I mean, I would beg people to come and visit my dad, people that he in business supported businesses that were going to go bankrupt and he would just give them like one for $80,000. And you think I could get them to come and visit him? He'd lost all of my family, my, my, his ex-wife, my sister, and all the extended family there. And he wasn't very close with his family outside of my daughters and myself, my two daughters, and myself, and my two grandsons and son-in-law, you know, he lost everything. And you think you could get anybody to come. It's just, we really, it's, I don't understand it. And uh, we really, really need to work at more, uh, complacency not complacency but compassion and and not being so like you're it's not a disease that if you talk to somebody in the room you're going to catch it you know <laughs> like I, th so. I think the problem is is people don't know like they knew your father in this capacity and they don't know how to deal with him in this new capacity and it's it's frustrating and it's disturbing and it's scary and you don't know what to do i mean it's just like you're multiplying negative feelings. And so people just naturally as humans are like, nope, not dealing with that. And I, that's where the education comes in. It's like, I'm, I'm, I'm a huge advocate. If you get a diagnosis, you need to put a care team in place. I have an article on my website on how to do that. Um, I don't want to, my, my listeners should know what that story is, but it's bringing people in early. And one of the kindest yeah. things is, is it's like, when they still, you know, can have a decent conversation with you and, you know, you're, you, move, you move and learn along as their disease progresses. You're not coming in mid-stage going, holy crap, what the, this woman's asked well, me the same question five times in 10 minutes. <laughs> and I know, and I know what you're saying, because that's the exact thing we need to get thrust into is this changing parent or, or sibling or elder that we're caring for it's just as alarming and daunting for us we just mm -hmm. we, we don't have a choice and so i hear what you're saying and i'm super compassionate to that perspective that it can be overwhelming at the same time i would just ask people to reflect on if it was you just you know put yourself in that, those shoes how would you want everybody to abandon you in your older age like i was actually depressed for so long when i saw this I thought, like we live our whole life to be revered in some way, to leave a legacy. And then if our brain doesn't quite function so well, it's how quick are we forgotten about? And that just, just kills my heart, you know? And I, I just ask people to um, try to put yourself in their shoes, you know, and, and, and pull up your big girl and boy pants and just <laughs> go sit and have a conversation and just come from the heart. You know, connect yeah. on a soul, heart to heart level with them. And uh, yeah, it can be challenging. You also grow as a coach. I have to say this, the more challenging the situation you put yourselves in, the more you grow and, uh, you know, wiser you get. So true. Very true. I just think, <laughs> I think there's a lot of barriers to early diagnosis. So we need to start there. So what Absolutely. kind of warning signs, like I've talked to so many people who are like, I don't want to know. It's like, but you could make these plans and do these financial things and these legal things. And you could, you know, you could maybe change how you're living so that you can do things you wanted to do in 10 years. Maybe you're going to start doing them now, blah, blah, blah. People are like, I don't want to know. I mean, it's just, it's like they put a paper bag over their head and it's like, I don't really want to know either. My mother had Alzheimer's, her mom had vascular dementia and my maternal great grandmother had dementia. So like, I really don't want to know. I've dealt with it enough, but you know, well, there are, there's reasons we should know in early. 
Well, absolutely. There's reasons we should know early because there are some studies that are coming out now from a holistic approach and of the medical community that the earlier we, we get a hold of it, the better chance we have of stopping it from progressing. Right. So absolutely. You want to know early in my opinion. And so I think you're right. I think early diagnosis is key. I think the minute you start to know yourself, like how many times do you forget where you've parked your car in the parking lot? How many times do you lose your keys? I mean, I, my daughters and I laugh about that all the time. I am. So I, that's one of the other reasons I'm writing and reading is to keep my brain active and, and be proactive about it. You know, I think we were in this day and age of technology too, where it's easier to listen to an audiobook. And I don't disrespect to you because you're running a podcast and I ran one too, when I was doing the caregiving thing briefly. Um, but force yourself to, to use your brain in ways that technology has taken away from us because it's, it's, it's a scary process if we don't really work at it. So I think early detection is absolutely key. You can stop it from progressing medically, holistically. It's just it happened. I've heard too many stories about it now. And you can get those things in check that you need to get in check because once you're too far gone and you've not, you're no longer at capacity, you've now put a huge burden on the people that you want to take care of you because now they're fighting a legal system. They're fighting time. They're fighting a medical industry that doesn't necessarily um, equate to the caregiver role and the struggles. And you don't want that for the person that you're asking to care for you. You want them to have time and devotion. I, that's how I felt. I felt very resentful that I had to go through all this baloney and time away from taking care of my dad because it was almost a full-time job for very many months dealing with all the fires that would come up that I had no idea about that I had to put out the financial ramifications of all this. And um, so you don't want to be in that role. You want to enjoy time with your loved one and hopefully be able to prevent it and put all those safety measures in place early, early on. So, Well, additionally, too, is if you get an early diagnosis and you make lifestyle changes, you might be able to slow down the progression. So you may actually just die earlier, not earlier, well, earlier in the disease, not earlier in your lifespan. I hope that makes sense. So you may not get to the bed bound, having to be fed and changed and all of that ugliness um, because, you know, you, you get to 90 and you're not at that stage. So that's, yeah. that's another reason for early diagnosis. So what yeah. kind of warning signs should caregivers be aware of? You know, they're already doing a lot. And they're kind of blissfully thinking everything is going fine. But, you know, I mean, this sounds like I agree. This needs to be a movie because I think I'd watch it. It just it sounds. I, I mean, haven't it's... even given you I haven't even given you the tip of the iceberg because like you said to me, you're writing three books. Yeah, well, you have no idea. You have no idea. So, well, so that um... sounds like three movies. <laughs> so I should connect you to Love Conquers All. She's a filmmaker in Los Angeles. She's working oh, on a wow. film called No Country for Old People. Um, I have no connection to Hollywood, so I'm not of any of use for your, your movie uh, debuts. But um, yeah, maybe she could help. But what warning signs should we, um, should we be looking for? Like paying so if, attention if to. If you're not living with your loved one, so I would just go through their bank statements, get permission to go through their bank statements. And I know it sounds kind of grueling. I would be doing that once a week at a bare minimum because, I mean, my dad's mom was in for risk for this. Every company call and she was donating all her money to, you know. So there's the donation piece that comes from outside of families looking to see that all of, you know, get a statement of, you know, an accounting of what her monthly or his monthly payments are, are they making their payments? Are they missing payments? I think you want, it's, it's not even just signals. It's being proactive, I think, on top of the signals. And then as far as the signals, are they forgetting things like their keys? Are they losing their bank cards? Are they forgetting where they park their car if they're still driving? Um, you know, do you have a dysfunctional family background? Because I mean, that is prominent. I, I think, it, as I said earlier, more of the it's unfortunate that I've heard from the police and the Dementia and Alzheimer's Society, both in the U.S. and Canada, most of it is family, other family members. So I'll, we, let's face it, there's not really very many families out there right now that doesn't have some sort of, you know, internal stuff going on. So, you know, I think you want to really have some conversations with your loved one. And if they're beyond that, you absolutely want to be checking the, the statements. 
because a parent, you know, to be approached by a sibling of yours that might be taking advantage of them, it's a really hard job. So to tell a, a child that you can't keep giving and giving and giving, even if the parent doesn't have the money to give. I mean, my dad, sent my sister 28,000 US dollars for the deposit for their million dollar home, which was 40,000 Canadian after the separation agreement, after they stole everything. And you know what he had left in his bank account after that? 5,000. That was it. No income, you know? So, so I don't know if I've answered that as far as enough things. I think you need to be proactive and you need to start listening and paying attention to, are they forgetting a lot? Are they confused? Are they making their payments? Are they prone to be giving too much? Are my siblings maybe reaching out, asking for loans, um, cousins or whoever else in the family? And sorry to say, the more dysfunctional the family, the more likely it is. And I see so many caregivers that are in families. I've seen this hundreds and hundreds of times where the family members all want their parents' money, but they're the only ones caring for the caregiver. That should be a massive red flag. And I know that happens a lot where one person's, taking on the role of caring for the caregiver in the health wise, but everybody wants their hand in the financial pie. So, you know, I think if you have a history of it, you need to be on higher alert because that's where the statistics come from. And I I hate to say that, you know, I hate to be a negative Nelly. That's just the reality. Yeah, I think it's, and this is going to, this is not justification whatsoever, but I think like my dad was really good at loaning my, giving my sister money. and. You know, it's like you're behind on your property taxes. Somehow you got um, permits to put in a pool and then daddy's got to help pay off the back taxes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, But that was not out of the norm for him. Like he would have done that anyway. And he offered to give me some money when I flew off my bike and busted my collarbone. And I didn't have health insurance because that's a whole other podcast. (laughs) So I had to pay. It's much cheaper to pay for crap out of pocket. But if you don't have the money, you're kind of screwed. So that wasn't out of the norm. But I think, you know, people feel, well, you know, he always helped me out with X or mom would have wanted me to have Y or it's really easy to to justify it in your brain. And I'm like, and I'm I'm not condoning yeah. this at all. Um, you know, it's like, ah, oh, this is the third time I've had to go pick up a prescription. I'm just going to, I'm just going to use mom's debit card to pay for mine as well, because I'm entitled because this is my third trip and they're always taking an hour. And so three hours, I mean, you know, yeah, I'm not saying you're entitled, but it's, I think people can understand how it's kind of easy to just sort of, you know, let yourself get away with it. And, you know, maybe it's minor things and obviously it's not stealing millions of dollars like your dad had happened to him, but it's family. It's, it's not like you're ripping off the neighbor. That would be harder to just. No, no, I get that. And, you know, my mom probably justified it because my dad was an alcoholic and he wasn't he, as big a heart as he had. He always, and that's another thing to look for. Does your parent or have the propensity to be a giver? Cause those are, you know, people will take advantage of that when they're, um, so my dad was always a giver, even though he was abusive when he was, he was Jekyll and Hyde. He was either mm. the nicest man on the face of the earth or, you know, you didn't know what you were coming home to. And so, yeah, my mom justified that. And all I have to say is karma is a B I T C H. <laughs> so, you know, just remember like, um, I, it, only everybody can judge when you're, you know, your comment about, uh, you know, $50 if you're, you know, prescription or whatever. I mean, that's, that's a little different. You know, if you're using gas and running errands and, you know, I just think you have to be upfront with your parent when they have the capacity to have that dialogue, you know, Mm -hmm. um, and, and do it before they, you know, while they have capacity. And, and I think only you can live with the consciousness of, does it feel right? If I have an inkling that this feels like it's pushing that line a little bit too much, then you know not to do it. And, um, everybody's conscious is different. Everybody's relationships are different. I'm sort of talking more larger scale, obviously, and um, because that happens too. <laughs> and then the, the other thing is happening in Canada is because my dad's got a pension from the government to a self-employed of $1,600 a month. So now the taxpayers are paying the discrepancy because mm. I, I've i had, I lost all my coaching clients. I'm just rebuilding. And then I'm going to have to now, put, so it's like, so these people are running around in million dollar homes, taking trips to Australia and Europe and a cottage. And I'm, you know, paying the rest of his life the discrepancy or the tax i don't have to legally in canada or the taxpayer does so i mean there's it's a communal thing it's a communal it's a societal problem yeah 
Well, one of my platforms I like to stand on is we're not going to see a significant change until big corps in this country, America, don't know if it's the same in Canada, probably similar, um, until they realize it's already affecting their bottom line, big change is not going to happen fast enough. I mean, it's that's just... Yeah, and that's what the elder, the sergeant of the elder abuse said to me, because he talked to me for about a half an hour. He said, look, I know exactly what they've done. I feel badly for having to make this call. Um mm-hmm. However, in the court system, because it was power of attorney was done from a hospital room, not a courthouse on a holiday, you have a chance of 1% of getting it convicted. And um, he said, you know, if, if we thought about money differently, almost, almost all crime would go away. And that's, you know, my mom hadn't worked in 40 years, probably has low self-esteem. And, you know, we have to treat money differently. Why is it so high up in our societal viewpoint that it's worth defrauding other people or killing people or for god forbid that happens you know why what makes money worth that what makes money giving up our our integrity and our souls to we have to look at money differently you know you can earn it just as easily legally as you can it illegally so you know and that was a really that was a really good point he made like as soon as we start changing how we think about money most of the crime will go away in this world. Yep. So. Definitely money is definitely kind of the root of all evil in a lot of respects. And it's the way we deal with it. It's got a lot. It of- doesn't have to be. No, I, you know, they people, you know, yeah. I'm in California. I was just watching. Um, oh, I was watching America's Got Talent. And there's this group from LA that some of them have been unhoused. They work with the unhoused. There are 75,000 homeless people in Skid Row in Los Angeles. My old hometown, 75,000 people was the um, population. And it's all because we are just fine with people making billions of dollars while, you know, the bottom of the tier worker can't pay their bills. Like, I was not an advocate necessarily. I wasn't against it, but I was not necessarily a full-throated advocate for raising the minimum wage. Because I was thinking back to the old days when teenagers had minimum wage jobs. And my daughter said, if somebody works 40 hours a week, shouldn't they be able to afford a basic apartment, a reliable car, and a basic, you know, mobile phone? I'm like, well, yeah. And she's like, does it matter how old they are? And I'm like, no. So, you know, it's like when we fix these money problems, I think a lot of our, our global problems will stop. So yeah. I applaud you for yeah. at least your... <laughs> You're plugging away internationally, both sides of the border up there, trying to fix laws for our elders. So, um, yeah. is there some place online people can find you, get a hold of you? When are the books I, expected? <laughs> I, I, my, I started writing it as, like I said, as a fictional, just because it's lighter. I think it's too heavy a topic, and um, so the I started writing the second book first, just because I was just pouring myself out. So the book will call be called Elaborate labyrinths because like i said it, it's like indiana jones trying to feed find the desperate housewives treasures um it was, it was I love that well. combo. so so elaborate labyrinths and my website is uh leanne l-i-a-n-e j mckinley m-c-k-i-n-l-e-y and uh i'm gonna say her hopefully by spring next year hopefully sooner um, I'm also, I'm back coaching real estate teams. So pretty crazy busy. So, um, <laughs> hopefully within the next six to nine months, I'm going to have it, um, have it out there. And do you have a publisher? I'm going to self-publish. Oh, okay. I've already self, I've already self-published before on Amazon. So it'll be on Amazon elaborate labyrinths. And, um, it's not even just going to be for caregivers. It's just, uh, it's, um, it's not necessarily geared for caregivers. It's more the trauma and the, the adventure and how to find the money. And it's, you know, it's, it's going to be somewhat of a thriller. Like I said, the attorney that helped me through all this, he uh, was a helping my dad in business when he, my, when he lost his work visa, when my mom stole his money out of the U S and then he, I didn't know who to go to. So I just started emailing everybody that I knew at the beginning, all the attorneys that my dad had, been friends with and this gentleman helped me till the end without a penny and he had said well you have to write this because this, I mean he was in every email of all 700 that police got and it was like wild so it'll be entertaining 
<laughs> hopefully some humor and hopefully just, you know, as a spiritual person, just as hard as it is, as it is try to find the light in it because there's, there can't be all bad to situation. There's always a double-edged sword to something, the good and the bad. And hopefully it's going to inspire people that are feeling some lost, you know, lost religiously or spiritually right now in life. And I know a lot of caregivers feel that way. Losing your sense of yourself is a big component to it. So hopefully they'll find some inspiration uh, in the entertainment and, and hopefully some um, some hope at the end of the day. Well, I hope everybody makes sure uh, the website will be linked in the show notes like usual. Keep up with Leanne so we know when these get published. And um, as soon as we stop hitting record, I'll give you um, Su- Susie's, Susie Singer Carter. Carter Singer? Double last names always throw me off. Um, <laughs> I'll, okay. I'll find her email for you. But yeah, I'm looking forward Thank to you. it. I love like psychological thrillers. So I'm looking forward yeah. to this. Um, I always say things like, um, kind of not sure I want to know this person personally because their mind goes to like really scary places. So <laughs> glad I met you before I read the story because I'd be like, is this like an international financial criminal that wrote this book? Because uh, how do you yeah. know these things? <laughs> no, just the lady that lived through the craziness that's, you know, lived through it to tell the story. So it's based on fact written as a fiction because, I, you know, I also... I don't want to anybody coming after me legally. Uh, yeah. So writing it as a fiction. Yep. I can see the disclaimer in the front of the book already. <laughs> <laughs> there was a lawyer involved in this and a judge. Just leave it there. Right. So oh, that sounds awesome. Well, everybody keep up with Leanne's website. So we know when she publishes, because like she said, she only told us the tip of the iceberg and now I'm super curious. So thanks so much for joining Thank us you. and sharing your story and the warning signs and, and, and what you're doing. Thank you very much for trying to make a difference internationally. I mean, I know Canada is not like that far away, but it's still yeah. got to be complicated. Absolutely. Thank you for having me, Jennifer. And thank you for everything that you do. It's amazing. Fading Memories is also available wherever you get your podcasts. <laughs>